it's my pleasure today to give you an uh, update on the state of our technical infrastructure uh, of Clarin. Um, and um, traditionally, I have the honor to present this, but let me uh, um, may ensure you that uh, this is not uh, just the work from one person of, of only one team. This is really kind of a very large distributed effort from all our centers, all our consortia. Uh, and it's just me who has today the honor of uh, showing some of the outcomes uh, of that. Good, let's first start with, uh, say, the technical core of our infrastructure, so-called B centers, our technical uh, centers who are hosting uh, the repositories. Um, and here you can get a bit of an overview of what has happened since the last uh, annual conference. Um, we haven't had any new B centers being uh, recognized, but we have had two reassessments of existing centers, uh, our Slovenian uh, colleagues uh, center and the uh, ACDHCH in uh, Austria, in Vienna, um, who went through the whole process of a new uh, uh, center assessment, but also of the new core trust seal procedure, which is part of our uh, assessment procedure. Um, there are six more procedures or B Center uh, certification procedures pending, which basically means that they are waiting for the Core Trust Seal to be granted. Uh, core Trust Seal, as you might know, is a procedure, uh, kind of a self assessment, but uh, reviewed by an external panel also, um, looking at all kinds of organizational issues around the setup and the maintenance of a data repository. And there we currently have um, two new centers who are still un underway there for reassessments. We've noticed that there is a period of about eight to 12 months or so often before uh, the CTS is granted uh, finally. This is also something where we organizationally are going to try to keep a closer look at how the situation is with uh, uh, this whole procedure with the individual centers. Overall, uh, where we stand today, well, we have 23 certified uh, centers uh, of an overall to total of 68 registered centers. Actually, it's 69 because uh, just uh, two days ago or so we registered uh, another, uh, another C center, but these are the, the rough numbers. Um, and maybe good to, um, to mention here is the fact that the 18th assessment round, uh, the deadline for that uh, assessment round will be 29th of October. Um, so end of next month, if you want to participate as a candidate B center, please make sure to uh, submit uh, on time and take a look on the website for the, for the details around this. Um, yeah, I've put the 18th here in bold actually because this means that there already have been 17 assessment rounds. So uh, over the past couple of years, uh, I think we can clearly see that there is some um, uh, strong um, procedure and strong tradition being shaped with doing these assessments. And, and if you look at uh, where we are, uh, looking back and knowing that uh, 17 times uh, the assessment committee has done the work of going through all the submissions, the centers have uh, sent and resent their uh, certification requests. This is really a substantial effort, and, and it's uh, I think worthwhile putting this in a in a bold face. Uh, therefore, good. Um, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, there we are. Um, since we've been presenting these kind of numbers for the last couple of seven years or so. I thought it was good to, to also put this a bit in a historic perspective. So uh, try to illustrate here the number of, um, of centers that we have had since 2015 up to, uh, up to this year. And you can see the green parts of the, uh, of the graphs are uh, the B centers, the, the blue uh, sections are the other centers. And what you actually can see is that we started with a relatively high proportion of, uh, of B centers and fewer of the others. And that over time, actually uh, the number of other centers, so for instance, C centers and K centers has grown. Um, I think that also is quite a logical um, transition in that sense that 
as of the beginning, we had a kind of a hardcore of technical centers that were absolutely preparing to be to be recognized and to uh, be part of the game as of the as of the beginning. Later on, um, many centers uh, and uh, through new consortia, etc., uh, also um, came into existence, but started with uh, uh, another ambition or another status and so if you look where we are today uh, as mentioned we have these 23 uh, b centers and we have uh, 26 c centers so centers that are providing uh, metadata and uh, 25 uh, knowledge centers as uh, were already introduced i think during the uh, the Claren, uh, cafe that was uh, presented during the lunch uh, so what you can see here is that there is um, a kind of a uh, I think a healthy growth and at the same time also a kind of reasonable proportion between uh, the B centers and the other types of centers. Um, the numbers that I mentioned don't necessarily always add up and that is because some centers have a dual status. So there are C centers that also are a K center, um, et cetera. Um, yeah. In any case, also maybe good to mention here that um, what we have seen also in the past is that certain centers are sometimes in between certifications uh, because uh, sometimes the deadlines for um, the procedure don't necessarily align with the timelines of uh, national funding uh, for instance and then we see sometimes that the center uh, is the b center falls back to the c status for a half a year or so and then can apply again to become a b center so there is uh, quite a bit of uh, dynamics in there and and i think that's also part of a kind of a healthy and normal situation also on the longer uh, longer term um, then let's have a look at some uh, other um, numbers um, this is um, an overview of the um, federated uh, login um, it shows actually the kind of potential of our federated login so the possibility to authenticate with your institutional credentials to a clearance service it shows the growth of uh, connected organizations so numbers from say universities or other organizations from which you can log in and if you look back uh, all from the beginning it was uh, below thousands up to uh, today uh, over two thousand uh, um organizations that are uh, connected um at the same time uh, if we look uh, globally we can see that uh, currently out of the 25 members and observers that clarin has there are 24 that are connected so i think in terms of potential connectivity this is uh, quite well but let us also take a look at the actual uh, use of this because potential yeah is some indication that actual use gives us some, some better insight and there we see that actually the number of uh, monthly logins that we have seen since 2015 has really grown from under 1500 to over 3000 um, monthly logins 3163 uh, over the past year um, what we also can see here is that there was a kind of significant increase since the last year, a kind of 41% increase since 2020. Um, Try to explain that uh, by maybe some outliers or strange events happening or so. But uh, so far with a kind of first attempt, we couldn't really find that. So it really seems that this is based on increased uh, use since uh, last year. Um, yeah, it's difficult to speculate what the exact reason is for such a peak, but it's in any case uh, nice to um, to see this. Okay, so far for the federated login. Um, there's a lot of other activities that have been taken uh, place or have been taking place also over the past couple of years. One of them is uh, some software development uh, in the realm of the virtual language observatory, so our metadata. Um, catalog um, and there's a new release that has been uh, uh, yeah, put into production uh, with several new features uh, one of them is a temporal coverage facet so which basically allows you to restrict uh, the, the metadata records uh, that pertain to a specific time period um, it's available, so please uh, take a look and, and play around with it. But it's quite nice, especially to uh, be able to find um, uh, historic uh, resources. And as you can see an example here where you first restrict the time span between 1800 and 1897. And then in the next step, it allows you to search for uh, specific resources from that time. 
Um, second new feature that's been added here is also illustrated here, and that is actually um, the inclusion of connection to the language resource switchboard. So the say uh, part where uh, you can connect to the Clarent processing tools uh, in a pop-up. Um, and this is nicely illustrated from the screenshot from the virtual language observatory. Uh, now, another reason why I wanted to show this is because uh, this also came with a bit of um, uh, JavaScript that you can actually very easily include in your own uh, applications. So if you are interested in connecting to the language resource switchboard from within any web application that you host yourself, uh, please uh, yeah, be reminded by, about the fact that you can do this by including some uh, JavaScript. And we are uh, very glad to assist with this also. So it's, it's um, not a very difficult thing to do and um, you get a nice uh, pop-up as demonstrated uh, over here. Okay. Then underneath the VLO, uh, there's, there's a lot of technical activities that are powering this whole metadata framework. Uh, I think I should also mention here some of the efforts from the uh, CMDI task force working on uh, the creation of so-called core components. Don't have the time to go into the details of that, but that's uh, been a substantial uh, effort that's been done. Um, at the same time, uh, there's also been some development um, at say the, to make the VLO faster and more efficient. Uh, first of all, the VLO has been migrated to a really faster server. Um, at the same time, we also took the opportunity of moving cert certain services uh, to all the same server because they all needed access to over a million of uh, XML files, and then it's much more efficient if you can do this on the same machine. So now we have the harvester, the harvest viewer, and the metadata curation dashboard running on the same machine. And the screenshot over here, you can see uh, the harvest viewer in action, which is a bit of a technical um, part of our infrastructure, uh, but which comes in very handy to debug all kinds of problems to see when the last harvest run uh, happened, uh, to see if there are any problems, have a look at log files, whatever. Um, so this is a very yeah, crucial instrument in the, um, in the overall uh, infrastructure. It's typically one of these things that are in the back end that not everybody sees every day, but for which we are very happy that it is uh, working. Good, uh, I mentioned the metadata curation dashboard. Uh, that is one uh, part of uh, our infrastructure that allows to check um, for uh, all kinds of criteria for the metadata, whether it's valid, whether it is uh, uh, complete, uh, whether the links are, uh, are working. Um, and there's been a lot of work in the last year, uh, especially by uh, Wolfgang Sauer from uh, uh, the uh, ACDH uh, CH uh, Center um, on reworking the curation dashboard. Um, that there's a lot of things again that happened in the background, like restructuring of database uh, schemas, as you can uh, see some uh, illustration from here in, in, in this uh, slide. Um, but at the same time, uh, also to, to uh, make sure that the link checker, for instance, is running uh, stably, uh, that there is better logging, um, etc. And it's very important because right now, if you look at it from those million metadata records that we are harvesting. We have uh, uh, and are checking about 5 million links. And that's really something that cannot be done just overnight, but you really need to spread it over time. So therefore it's also important that this process is kind of continuously running, is stable, is um, and is, is, is producing trustworthy uh, effects, very important. Good, now we come to the virtual uh, collection registry, which is another piece of important uh, uh, software um, in, in our infrastructure, uh, and which allows to create digital bookmarks uh, and sets of bookmarks, which then can be cited and used in other contexts. Um, there's been a lot of uh, releases here. Uh, big thanks to, to Willem. Uh, it's nice that at least one person I can uh, <laughs> say thank you to uh, that I see here in, the, in my own office. Um, there's a new uh, smoother user interface. Uh, it comes with some improved functionality, uh, for instance, like the merging of, uh, of collections. Um, comes with better programmatic access, uh, so such as the uh, 
uh, an API that is now documented with the uh, open uh, API uh, framework. Uh, it allows for token-based authentication in such a way that you can more easily interact with it uh, through common clients or through your own programming uh, interface. There's still some more um, functionality in the pipeline. Uh, for instance, the uh, copying uh, of, uh, of collections or making specific forks of, uh, of a collection uh, and the related version control and also some collaborative editing because we see some value in creating a virtual collection uh, together. Um, yes. Then a new piece of software to be uh, mentioned here, uh, the Digital Object Gateway, uh, acronym DOG. Um, which is uh, intended as a framework um, to access digital objects and collections uh, in a uniform way. And I've put these slides on purpose in between the ones from the virtual collection registry and from the language resource switchboard, because in many senses, it is a kind of the, the missing link between uh, both with the idea that um, certain uh, objects or collections uh, that can not be processed today by the language resource switchboard uh, will be able to be processed by a collaboration with this piece of uh, middleware, so to say. Um, the idea is that you actually can uh, then access uh, specific uh, APIs, uh, that you can access uh, repositories that are also existing outside the, the Clarion uh, world, think of uh, Zenodo or uh, B2Share, um, and then uh, extract the relevant links to data objects and process it with either your own program or, for instance, uh, the switchboard. It will be available as Python library, uh, on top of that as a REST uh, API. And uh, again, on top of that REST API, there will be um, a web application uh, that you can use. Um, and the idea or, well, the idea as I mentioned is to, to connect to many different systems. If you look where we are today, there is already the library available. Uh, you can find it here at this uh, URL um, in the first pre-release version. So uh, please bear with possible bugs and, and, and lacks in documentation that are currently there. But if you look at it where it is today, it can already connect from uh, Python programs to the Clarion repositories, um, to some other repositories. So as I mentioned, uh, Zenodo, B2Share, to the virtual collection registry and to the Europeana API. And it will be extended further. That's also a bit of the idea to make it uh, kind of piece of software that enables plugins to make sure that in the future things can also be easily connected to the Clarin infrastructure. Good, as I said, uh, the doc was in between the virtual collection registry and the language resource switchboard, um, of which we've also seen a new release with version 2.3.0, uh, several improvements to the user interface, uh, more file formats were uh, recognized. Um, and maybe good to mention here also that in the new version, which is currently in beta, um, is there is support to extract that text from uh, HTML and PDF files, which means that um, the number of tools that you can use to process data will significantly uh, increase because we have more tools that can deal with plain text than the, those that can deal with, say, HTML or PDF. It's a small change, but it can have a big uh, impact. And finally, also good to mention here that there is uh, all the connected tools from the switchboard are now also visible from the uh, SSH open marketplace. That brings me to the shock or SSH uh, open, uh, open marketplace. Um, Good to mention here that uh, a lot of the hard work here in terms of the development has been done uh, in the framework of the shock project. So together with uh, with SESDA, with Daria, but especially also through the ACDHCH center where people have been uh, coding on the, um, on the marketplace. And one important addition there is the fact that uh, the tools from the switchboard have been automatically ingested into the uh, into this marketplace in such a way that you don't need to register your tools twice that you avoid duplication of work. Uh, the marketplace, uh, I mean, the URL is uh, visible over here, uh, currently in a beta version, uh, but already allows now to, to have a look at things like uh, data sets, tools, uh, training materials and publications and the relation between those entities. Definitely worth a visit. 
good something on the uh, backend and uh, service uh, mobility. Um, it's it's been one of the you know these small details in the infrastructure that uh, don't necessarily come to the surface very quickly but uh, uh, some of our colleagues have been working on uh, making our um, architecture less um, say intel bound uh, so by creating a docker compose pipeline that supports multiple architectures um, and the the immediate um, reason for doing so was the introduction of the new uh, macbooks which are running on arm uh, processors uh, but i think in terms of strategic long-term perspective this could be an important part for the future since um yeah well it's it's absolutely not uh, not clear that uh, that the computing centers and the data centers that we see today will be running on intel uh, still in in five years time so having some flexibility there i think is an important uh, part and and therefore uh, yeah I, I think this is a very good kind of anticipation on such uh, changes an important one Good, then we come to the yearly uptime. So this is an average uh, of uh, nine of our core central services um, uh, yeah, uh, calculated per year. And as you can see here, we have a fairly good track record, I would say, uh, since two th 2017, we have this uh, calculation. And what you can see here is that uh, this year we were up to what was it, 99.93% uh, uptime. There's some minor, uh, minimal variations, uh, but it's good to keep in mind that, that the difference between the 99.94% that we had last year and the 99.93% that we have this year means something like, uh, what is it, uh, uh, five hours, uh, um, sorry, no, that, that's a difference of uh, 53 minutes uh, per year. So these are really minimal uh, variations. It's good to realize that the uh, scale here is really already at the upper end of, um, of the whole percentage uh, calculation. So I think this is going uh, relatively well. Um, as an illustration of our uptime, and I found this a very nice illustration, uh, the uptime of uh, maybe our most boring piece of infrastructure, our discovery service. So the screen that you get to see when you uh, try to log in to some uh, service provider. Um, this is really not something um, uh, how to say uh, exciting in terms of uh, functionality, but it's very important because if you don't get this screen, then you can simply not uh, log in and the whole login chain uh, gets blocked. So therefore it's, it's crucial that this is, comes with a high availability and uh, this year we got 100% uptime of this uh, service, um, which might be a good illustration also of the fact that um, this service is uh, set up redundantly, but it's uh, overall the, the past uh, years that we have measured the first time that we get this 100% uptime of this, this service. And I think that, uh, yeah, that uh, deserves uh, some, some applause for the colleagues who have been uh, working on this. Thank you very much. Good. Um, another piece of uh, infrastructure um, is our uh, website. Um, and also this year, um, a lot of work has been uh, put into, into that, uh, more than we originally thought. Uh, when we were talking at the previous annual conference, we would we hope that by the end of uh, 2020, we would have the new website fully installed and in place. Um, that took a bit longer, also because the overall process was uh, uh, more complex than just taking another website. Uh, we had to do a whole conversion from uh, Drupal version seven to Drupal number eight. Uh, Drupal number, uh, eight. Uh, and then afterwards we needed to reconfigure um, themes, uh, menus, uh, what have you. Um, and again here, I mean, there's, there's some uh, special acknowledgement of the hard work by, by Andre, Michal and Elisa who have been really doing tons of work to, to get, this, uh, get this going and to, uh, make sure that all the uh, open ends were being put together and, and were in such a way that the website was actually working in the end. Um, it's good to mention here that uh, as first visual improvement, uh, a visible improvement for, for visitors, there is now uh, better visibility of some of the key elements of our infrastructure. That is, uh, first of all, uh, the data and the tools that are provided by the centers. You can find them in a special section on uh, language uh, resources. Um, and also the knowledge infrastructure for which there is also now some more visibility on the front page of our website. Um, 
in the sections of the tools and of the, the data, uh, there is also an important link now between um, listing of our centers who, have, who are providing certain services or certain uh, repositories um, and the material that has been collected for the Tour de Clarine. Uh, and as you can see here through the featured example links, um, we've tried to make that connection between the service offering, the, the data offering that there is on the website and the more descriptive material that we have from the Tour de Clarine. And, and I'm very glad that this kind of connection is now uh, much better, uh, better visible through the use of these uh, featured examples. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, with a website, uh, we have now a framework that is in place that is uh, more future proof. Um, there's still a lot of work in terms of restructuring and rewriting parts of the of the website. And for that um, aspect, we would like to, to invite you to send also your feedback. So if you see certain things on the website that are not completely in shape or that could use rewording or maybe elements are missing or there's even maybe something wrongly described somewhere, please feel free to send us a bit of feedback in each uh, page of the site. You have this footer and there is this website feedback button uh, through which you can um, submit your feedback. Uh, we're, we're really thankful for all your input on this. Uh, also, please feel free to be very critical here. This is the kind of feedback that we need to make our website um, a better place and uh, to, to, uh, to work on it. Okay, I think that brings me to the um, end of my uh, presentation, but not without uh, thanking um, a couple of uh, couple of people. Uh, first of all, our assessment committee who has been doing a lot of hard work in assessing our uh, B centers, uh, our whole uh, central uh, developers uh, team, uh, all developers and contributors from the national uh, consortia. Uh, Claren is distributed, so we absolutely crucially depend on, on those teams and those people. Uh, our task forces, um, which were also mentioned here. And finally, also to all the people who have been uh, yeah, contributing to the construction and the operation of the, uh, of the infrastructure. Uh, a final thank goes to uh, Jurgita, who has been uh, sharing uh, this very nice picture um, uh, of, uh, of the warm reception of the Clarin value proposition uh, at her home office. Uh, at the same time, I think that's a, a kind of a nice reminder uh, to the fact that uh, this wasn't exactly an easy year or uh, a normal year in terms of working circumstances. So um, despite all the issues that there have been over the past couple of years, the struggles from the home office, or maybe the struggles uh, in, in lack of communication or all the other issues that, uh, that came up, uh, let me thank everyone for, despite those facts, uh, working so nicely together and uh, making sure that uh, yeah, our infrastructure is in the state where it is uh, today. Thank you very much for your uh, attention.